three, two, one. Hi, I'm Rosanna Vargas Forbes, and welcome to episode 129 of Art This Week. This week we visit the modern and speak with Cause about his work in the Focus exhibition. Now for Art This Week. You know, I never really strategized the color before the painting starts. Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll put in, you know, usually start with a, a main color. So I'll put in a gray and then respond to that and respond to that and respond to that. So it's sort of like a lot of times I, I start with these colors that sort of kind of don't work, you know, mm -hmm. and then I try to rescue myself back <laughs> from it. So I don't know, I just find that it, in the end, all, like any, there's no color that couldn't work together. So. I just, I like sort of the, the play of, of using these colors to kind of bring out the, the qualities of each other. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, it illuminates your process to me in that it's still a spontaneous act of painting, whereas this work is so refined, or it, it, it seems very, very refined and polished. So yeah. I would view that your process might be really, really structured. Um, with having a complete mock-up? There's, yeah, I mean, there's structure, but with the color, there's, the, it's not. And it's just a matter of, you know, just being in front of it and feeling, you know, at, at a different scale, like the colors I feel like might not even work, but at this scale, I feel like, you know, you, you find a balance and it's, it's not really something that there's a formula for. Can you tell me a little bit about the type of paint that you're using? And it's just acrylic. It's just acrylic? Yeah, it's all acrylic paint. Okay. It's just, um, you know, it's painted really wet and water down and all, instead of using traditional brushes I'm just using foam brushes from hardware stores oh, okay. and then except for you know the smaller elements or the line art and, mm -hmm. but yeah I, I guess by painting a lot of times I paint on the wall and on a table and it goes mm -hmm. the painting goes back and forth mm -hmm. um, smaller paintings are completely painted on the table mm -hmm. it's just you know with these pieces you can't get right. to the inner parts I think you're not tall enough. yeah no I haven't stretched my arm long <laughs> enough so with a piece like this, uh, which is called Companion, can you tell me a little bit about how you design, go, come to design a piece like this and determining the scale and how did you come to rely on these materials for the creation of it? I mean, with this sculpture, you know, before I started making larger sculptures, I was producing toys and mm -hmm. my first toy was called Companion that I, I made in, in, in 99. Mm -hmm. And it was, at the time, I was doing a lot of painting over advertisements and sort of taking popular iconography and reworking it and, and putting it back on the, you know, into the public. Mm -hmm. And I saw toys as sort of a way, like I've always wanted to do sculpture, but it just never seemed so, like accessible. Sure. And I saw the opportunity to do a toy instead of doing like a monumental piece, sort of like this, I could do a thousand mm -hmm. eight inch pieces that, you know, and I found a way to sell them on my own and it sort of, Led, in, led me into a whole different realm that I wasn't even looking for. But um, when I started to do the larger sculptures, it was important to me to kind of make them seem exactly like the small toys that I was making. So, you know, something like, like keeping the seam so you would, you would automatically think that these are like movable or, you know, I like to keep these elements and have there, there be really no difference from like, you know, a two inch piece to a 15 foot piece. And did, um I read somewhere that right after college you worked for Disney for a time period. I worked for a company, um, I worked for MTV and for Jumbo Pictures, which was purchased by Disney, and then they had us doing stuff for like painting backgrounds for 101 Dalmatians, mm -hmm. like TV shows and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually part of the reason why I got into using this type of acrylic paint. Oh, really? Yeah, it's just, um, you know, it's a common paint that they use in animation and mm -hmm. just seeing how they had such a formula for it and you know, you would, color, you would color in sort of all the character settings and keep it and like all the characters would have like a color tone set for like outside and inside and how they change and yeah, I mean, I, you know, for when I got out of school, working in animation was really just a check. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you know, I, was, I, went, I studied illustration in school and then as you get into your fourth year, you hit the realization like, well, there's not a lot of <laughs> options. Um, and so animation was just like, wait, I can paint every day and, and be paid. And mm -hmm. I kind of did that for a number of years until I eventually started just working completely on my own. Do you want to go into this other sure. room? The piece is called um, Black Dots. Mm -hmm. 
And I mean, when I was doing, I knew I wanted to do a series of Tondo paintings as one piece, and then the title just kind of came about. It's sort of when your eye removes from the retina, I think. Mm -hmm. You get this, it's like a thing called black dots. And I just thought, I don't know, it sort of applied. My, my titles are usually just taken around. I don't know if you've read any of the titles of the works, but. So is the title an important aspect of, of it's your usually work? It's usually an, after, an afterthought. Mm -hmm. You know, I usually have all the paintings done. And then sometimes as I'm doing it, I'll figure out a title, but sometimes it could be a week later. And, you know, I just write random things that kind of, kind of catch my eye. And mm -hmm. at some point I feel like, oh, this actually, this fits well with, with mm -hmm. this painting. Or Earlier in the day when we came to view the show, and the lights were out. Yeah, the, with the lights, a flashlight. Yeah, yeah, so it came in with a flashlight. So I, in coming in this morning, it allowed me to imagine if these were in my living room. Oh, yeah. And I, was <laughs> to, I was walking for coffee in the morning and passing these in the darkness. And, so, and it reminded me as a child um, when you're watching television at night, like in Just your bed. Just flicking, and it, yeah. yeah and, and, and the vibrancy of color and the way that your eye responds to color differently in the dark. So I wanted to ask you, with these blackout paintings, can you talk a little bit about your shift to darkness and to talking about this? Um, I've eye? always done, actually, even like in 2000, I did a bunch of black on black paintings. And when I did package paintings, when I did the Kimpsons, like the really bright stuff, I also did a series of just black and white sort of abstract paintings based on drawings from Michelin. And um, I've always been interested in sort of like how far you can take an image and retain its, recon like how recognizable it is or if people retain it at all. And, mm -hmm. you know, with taking the color away, taking most of the drawing away and sort of the effect of, of these things. And just through association, just through like knowing my work, mm -hmm. you can come in and see a piece like this and kind of understand it's a mouth with teeth or, mm -hmm. you know, even if it is on its own. And I just like the way you, you can get, like, you can pull different elements by just sort of extracting sections of, of graphics. and mm -hmm. so. so that visual language that we have, I think as a media culture, yeah. allows us to... Fill in the blanks. Yeah. When viewing other works by other artists, what are some, what are some things that you really respond to? When you're going, I mean, when you go to the museum, I, I felt, I looked at your blog, and you're pretty active. Um, Am I? I go, I go in spurts, I go in spurts, but... So what, um, what do you gravitate towards when you're, when you're viewing? Well, I mean, I'm definitely taking that Edward Shea painting home on my, my, my trip back. <laughs> I mean, put walk, it on top of the car. Yeah, walking into this museum. And, you know, a lot, I do like a lot of um, pop guys and different, you know, I also really into like A.C. Westerman, Peter Saul, Carl Worsom, like a lot of the Chicago Harry Who, like Jim Nutt, and just the sort of stuff they were doing in the 60s. And, um, I don't know, I just, I respond to so many different things, like in Japan, like artists like Tadanori Yoko and all his 60s, 70s prints, and then now his paintings, and yeah, and you go through phases, you kind of get into little, little niches, and you sort of look at a lot of stuff, and then, you know, as you kind of pull a new artist into your vocabulary, you sort of like, start realizing how that relates to all the other artists you've been looking at for years, and you know, so you see stuff here, and you know, you see like Augustine, you think about, Robert Crumb and early Peter Saul and all this like you sort of start to like add the dates up and see the parallels and, and the what's, conversation. yeah what's recognized what wasn't recognized why it was recognized and mm. I don't know it's sort of like a rabbit hole you can, sure. never ends. We want to thank Koss for speaking with us. The exhibition is open through February nineteenth, twenty twelve. More information on Koss can be found at cause1.com. For more information on the exhibition, go to themodern.org. Thanks for watching. This week we visit The Modern and speak with Cause about his work in on the Focus Exhibition. About his work on the Focus Exhibition. Nope. What do I keep saying? And last take. This week we visit The Modern and speak with Cause about his work about his work in the Focus. <laughs> It's all going on the outtakes. No, it's not.